Welcome to Hillcrest Baptist Church for our Sunday evening live stream service. Before we get started, let's have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, thank you for being so good to us and providing us with the technology to have a live stream. Please be with us as we sing and learn more about you. In Jesus' name, amen. and welcome to the youth live stream night. Please let us know more about you by filling out the connection form on our website at visithillcrest.org slash live. Don't forget to check in and let us know that you're watching tonight's service as well. If you did not receive a Fall Vision Sunday packet and would like one, please call our church office at 951-357-6737 or send us an email. Join us next Sunday as we have a special speaker, Dr. Mark Rasmussen from West Coast Baptist College, who will be preaching in the morning service and the evening service. Our morning services will continue at 9.30 a.m. as an outdoor drive-in service, and our evening service will be broadcasted on our Facebook and our website. That's all for the announcements. At this time, let us sing a few songs before tonight's message. Standing on the promises of Christ my King
joining us here for our youth live stream night today on September 13th and uh, first of all I just want to say to all the teenagers that participated thank you for participating and using your talents for God's glory and then to all of our teenagers in our youth group I just want to say thank you once again for each and every one of you we're so proud of all of you and especially how God is using you right now and also will be using you in the future we're praying for all of you. We're so thankful for your faithfulness, not only in church attendance, but also in your uh, prayer life and then also reading your Bible. Let me just encourage you to remain faithful and then also in all of those things, and then also obeying your parents and then also uh, studying hard in school, uh, especially with everything that's going on. We're praying for all of you. If you need anything at all, let us know. We're so proud of you. Uh, just wanna let you guys know that once again. And uh, we're so thankful for all of you. To all the parents of our teens, uh, we just want to say thank you. Uh, we're so thankful for your godly example and uh, how you raise your children in a godly way. And uh, if we could be a blessing to any in your family in any way, please let us know. Our youth ministry is here to support you as parents for these teenagers. And uh, we just want to let you know if you need anything at all, please let us know. And uh, we're also praying for all of your families as well. And thank you for your godly example and testimony. And then to our church family, we just want to say thank you for supporting our student ministries uh, over the past two years now. And through the various activities, events, and even the camps. And then also in prayer. And then uh, personally uh, to the teams as well as you uh, just give them an encouraging note or give them some snacks or to let them know that you're praying for them. Our teens always tell us about that and uh, they get excited about that and just want to thank you once again for just that encouragement. And if you could just continue to pray for our student ministries, especially with the pandemic happening, we want to plan a lot of activities and we still want to plan a winter camp in this December or January, but obviously we have to wait and see and also pray and see where God is leading us with all of this happening right now with the pandemic and so on. Uh, so if you just if you could just pray for our ministry here, the student ministries at Hillcrest Baptist, as we move forward for the next three months of this year, uh, it will be appreciated. We'll turn your Bibles to Acts chapter 17. We're going to read a lengthy portion of scripture here from verses 22 to 34. And uh, I entitled this message, Continue to Preach, a very simple message uh, entitled Continue to Preach. As we look at here, Paul's account, uh, what, what, when he's addressing the people at Athens, and he's addressing the people here on a hill known as Mars Hill, uh, also, uh, also known in, in, in other names such as Eripagus, and uh, various other names as well that's named after a Greek lowercase god, Ares. And uh, we're going to be reading about what happens here and how we can apply uh, Paul's tenacity to continue to preach uh, within our lives as well in this day and age because uh, there's a lot of similarities as well with that period of time and today's period of time that we could apply when we continue to preach the gospel uh, in our cities, in our families, and in our communities. So Acts chapter 17 verse 22 we're going to read from verse 22 down to verse 34. The Bible says here in Acts chapter 17, verse 22, Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things ye are too superstitious. 
For as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God. So Paul found uh, many altars. He, he indicates he found one altar here, but there are many altars here in Athens that had the inscription to an unknown God. We'll explain that in a minute. Uh, it continues here in verse 23, Whom therefore ye ignorantly worship, him declare I unto you. God said, God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is the Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in the temples made with hands, neither is worship with men's hands, as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things, and hath made of one blood and all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth, and hath determined the times before appointed, and the bounds of their habitation, that they may seek the Lord, if happily they might feel after him, and find him, though he may he be not far from every one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as certain also of our your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. For as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone, graven by art or man's device. And times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commanded all men everywhere to uh, where to repent, because he had appointed a day in which he would judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he had ordained, whereof he had given assurance unto all men, in that he had raised him from the dead. And when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, and others said, We will hear thee again of this matter. So Paul departed from among them, howbeit certain men clave unto him and believed, among the which was Dionysius and Ar the Arabicite and the woman named Damaris and others with them. Let's have a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you once again for just this opportunity to really just uh, dive into Paul's address here to the people of Athens on this uh, square that he's speaking at. And Lord, I pray that you just be with this message. Be with me as I preach. I pray that you would just empower, uh, you know, this message to really just relay uh, your truth from the Bible only and not personal opinions or anything like that. And we come to you humbly, Lord, to uh, worship you today. And I pray that this message can help us uh, to uh, continue to preach the gospel without fear and despite opposition, that we would uh, be uh, tenacious in our evangelism and continue to preach the gospel in spite of whatever is happening, Lord. We thank you once again for this day. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. As we look here in the book of Acts, in the 17th chapter of the book of Acts, we find here Paul once again addressing the people here in Athens in this area known as Mars Hills, also known as Eripagus. And uh, he's addressing the people here, and Paul is addressing uh, individuals that uh, many would consider an intellect or maybe philosophers, and there are a variety of different types of people that were gathered in this area to hear the Apostle Paul. There were people that were philosophers that were of uh, Epicurean philosophy or um, a Stoic philosophy. You might have heard those two philosophies when you uh, study uh, Roman history or Roman philosophy or Greek philosophy. And Ep Epicurus pretty much sums up, they believed that God existed but was no longer interested or involved in humanity. And the main purpose of this life, according to these philosophers that held, held on to these uh, Epicurean philosophies, uh, was that life was, the purpose of life was a pleasure of life. Stoic philosophers, you might have heard of Stoic philosophers, uh, you know, through various famous uh, philosophers, Roman philosophers, there are also senators like Cassius or, uh, you know, Cicero. And these Stoic philosophers believed that God was the world's soul, and uh, pretty much that the goal was to rise above all things, so no one showed an emotional response to either pain or pleasure. This is where we get the idea of a Stoic uh, face comes from, and Stoic philosophy. And these two worldviews were very opposing to one another. And the men that gathered here were, that were from, uh, that were Epicurean philosophers and Stoic philosophers, they loved to gather here just to do one thing, and that was to debate and argue. Now, they were already set in their viewpoints, but they just loved to gather and uh, to debate. And that's not very far off from our society that's today. 
you know, we have a society today where we have very uh, two political positions that are very opposing to one another more than ever before, especially now in 2020 compared to, let's say, 1960s. We have on the left, we have uh, certain uh, po po political views here, and then on the right, we have certain political views, and uh, it's very split uh, within our political aspect of our society, but also just in the way that we view life is very different as well. And people love to debate, it seems like, more than ever before. And oftentimes, even we have new movements that may seem political in the outward appearance, but now they're even becoming more religious or spiritual in many ways. And we also see a world that is really influenced by postmodernism, where truth is being questioned where no longer uh, people are holding to that there is an idea of an absolute truth, but truth is all relative, and no one will know the truth. And now we have younger generations of people questioning, what is truth? Is that really truth? Is what you hold to really truth? And we live in that type of society uh, today, where now there's different philosophies, different views, and now even that truth is being questioned more than ever before. And even within Christianity, there are new theories, theological theories on certain social issues that have come up. And we won't labor the time to go over those because it has nothing to do with the message. But really, when we look at our worldview today and our society, it's pretty much the same way that these Epicureans and Stoic philosophers were debating one another. And in our society, now there's debates happening with different philosophical views, different political views, now even different religious points of view. But most importantly, above anything that's very different from today to uh, back in the Roman Empire ages, is that now we see the influence of postmodernism, which is where truth has been questioned more than ever before. We've seen popular hashtags that you might have recognized that question the truth and fairness of the media. Now even conspiracy theories are becoming on the rise with certain groups that hold allegiance to certain leaders as well. And we see over and over again where now uh, different new things are coming up over and over again. But what about us as Christians? How do we respond to this? You know, it's easy for us to respond uh, based on our personal flesh or our personal emotions, but how do we respond to this? Well, just as Paul was gathering the people here, notice how Paul doesn't uh, get into this philosophical debate between these individuals. He was there for one purpose only, and that was to preach the gospel. He was there in these different cities for one purpose only, which is to preach the gospel. Obviously, he was to also plant churches, and then later he goes around to send letters to encourage these churches that he planted. But ultimately, the main purpose was that the gospel would be praised and God would be glorified. And as we look at here, we see Paul giving a strong apologetic defense of the faith, and there were those that were listening, and they chose to really just reject it with mockery, reject it with, uh, you know, uh, with doubt. But there are also those that were willing to listen and claim on to everything that Paul was speaking. And the varied responses here are uh, very uh, uh, appealing to each and every one of us that are reading the scripture to understand that no matter where we preach the gospel, there will be some that are willing to hear, some that will not. But ultimately, our purpose is not to get into a debate with somebody else, but our purpose is to preach the gospel so that souls would be saved. And in this day and age where now truth is being questioned more than ever before, in this day and age where now different political views and religious views and philosophies are popping up left and right on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, let us make sure that we are upholding one thing only, and that is the main truth, that Jesus is the only way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by Him, as stated in, by Christ Himself in John 14, 6. And today as we move forward by faith, let us make sure that we have a next generation of Christians that we are living in these postmodern times where truth is being questioned and no longer it is being held to the absolute. But let us make sure that we as Christians are ready to defend the faith. And are we ready to defend the faith? Are we ready to defend our faith with the Bible? Are we ready to defend what we believe? If somebody were to come up to each and every one of us and ask us, why do you hold to your beliefs as truth? What is it about your personal beliefs that is true? 
Let us make sure that we are understanding that we need to depend it more than ever before, uh, especially as we preach the gospel. And are we ready to continue to preach the gospel despite the opposition, perhaps even rejection and mockery? And I want us to look, take a look at three events within this short passage in the 17th chapter of the book of Acts, how we can apply this within our life in these contemporary times, uh, how we could get involved in personal evangelism and be tenacious in that, ultimately to see that God's God will be glorified in everything and the gospel will be propelled forward. And first of all, I want us to understand the first event here, the defense of the faith by the Apostle Paul. The defense of the faith by the Apostle Paul. The Bible says here in Acts chapter 17, verse 22, it says, Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things ye are too superstitious, for as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God, whom therefore ye ignorantly worship, him declare I unto you. And Paul was ready here to defend the faith. He was ready to defend the faith as he was about to preach the gospel. And Paul was addressing the religious idolatry that was happening here by these Greek uh, individuals that came about to hear Paul to an altar uh, to, that is made to an unknown God. And as we mentioned before, Paul mentions that I saw an altar that, that had an inscription to an unknown God. There were many altars within that city there that were uh, inscribed to this uh, idea that there was an unknown God. And the idea behind it is really, you know, it wasn't that they were uh, holding, they believed in this specific unknown gods. They had many altars to different gods like uh, Zeus and Ares and so on. They had many different statues that were lifted up to different lowercase gods. They just wanted to make sure that they didn't leave out any of them. So they decided to put one tomb or one, one uh, altar, one statue dedicated specifically to the unknown god in case these uh, Greek citizens forgot a god, that lowercase god, that they were worshipping. And Paul was giving it a ready defense of the faith, and he was probably even ready to debate here, but he wasn't interested in that. He was solely interested in preaching the gospel, making sure that these people, uh, he was trying to break down everything that they're holding to. They held on to this religious idolatry, and he had to break it down from the beginning. Look, look, all of what you're being taught is completely wrong. All of your religious views are completely wrong, and this is what it is. And the Bible says here in Acts chapter 17, verse 24 uh, to 25, God that made the world and all the things therein, seeing that he is the Lord of heaven and earth, dwelling not in the temples made with hands, neither is worship with men's hands as though he needed anything, seeing he give it to all life and breath and all things. And here Paul is referring to, uh, to making sure that uh, these individuals understand that all these gods are fake. You know, you, you need to worship the true God, which is the creator which is the Almighty. Genesis 1.1, it says, in the beginning, it was God that created the heavens and the earth. And he was really trying to relate the scripture understanding here of that in the beginning, the, all of this world creation here is not that God was invested in some kind of tree over there or it wasn't this humanistic uh, philosophy, but ultimately in the beginning, the truth is that God is the one that created the heavens and the earth. Not the gods that dwell in these temples that were made by your hands, but by the God that made all things here that you see, everything that we see here today. And some might wonder why he begins with creation. And it's really beginning here to explain the needed and stronger understanding of who God, the Almighty God, truly is. In fact, he wants to address the unknown God here. And you know, as I think about these two uh, statues to the unknown God, I think about the tomb of the unknown soldier. If you ever go to Washington, D.C., and uh, you know, in that area, in Arlington, Virginia, uh, which is the city south of Washington, D.C., if you ever go by there, uh, there is a national cemetery known as Arlington National Cemetery. And it was built around Robert E. Lee's home in that area. And obviously, you know, there's an urban legend that goes out there that says, you know, they built that cemetery in front of his house to make sure that it was a reminder to him of all the dead Union soldiers. But back to the main issue of the main, uh, main uh, reason I'm giving this illustration is because the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier is dedicated 
really uh, not to a particular soldier, but the tomb was dedicated to the heroic services of men and women who've made sacrifices, but they were unable to identify the bodies. Now, if you think about the various wars that the United States had been involved in, starting from the American Revolution in 1776 to all the way to even the recent wars of Afghanistan and Iraq, and then also all these different wars, there are certain soldiers that uh, were unable to be identified or they were considered MIA, missing in action, instead of KIA, which is killed in action. So this uh, memorial, the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier, is dedicated to those that are either missing in action or they were killed, but they were unable to identify the bodies. So you think about recently when President Trump was able to issue, or when uh, President Trump and Mike Pence were able to uh, issue an agreement to get some of the remains of the American soldiers back from the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, which is North Korea, he was able to get those bodies back. Those soldiers would have been considered an unknown soldier because they were unable to identify. And likewise here, once again, the altars that were dedicated here to the unknown God was uh, in some ways uh, in that same notion as well. They don't know who the God is, they don't know who that is, but they just wanted to make sure that they weren't leaving anybody out when it comes to their memorial or remembrance to all the lowercase gods that they were worshiping. So Paul really had to nitty gritty here, break it down and to get them to understand, you know, all this is wrong. You need to understand that it is the almighty uppercase God that created the world in the beginnings of the heaven. And he continues here and he tells those that are listening here that they need to repent because there is a judgment day coming. Because he was explaining to them not only did he create the heavens and earth, not only did he create all these different things, but he also created mankind. He had also created mankind. Genesis 1.26, we think about how God was speaking to not himself but to us. Let us make man in our image and he was explaining that uh, to make sure that we understand that the trinity is seen in the book of genesis there and uh, which is god the father god the son god the holy spirit and uh, he was explaining that and ultimately man has sinned as many of you are aware man has sinned through adam and eve and he was saying to all the people that are listening here in this square mars hill paul was saying you all need to repent acts chapter 17 verses 30 to uh, 31 it says uh, and at times of ignorance God winked at but now commanded all men everywhere to repent because he had appointed a day in which he would judge the world in righteousness by that man who had in had ordained, ordained whereof he had given assurance unto all men in that he had raised them from the dead. And as we think about the word repent here, it is uh, from the Greek word uh, metanoian which is to change one's mind or purpose. And man must repent because all of mankind is born with sin. Romans 5.12, it says, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. And this is talking, referring to one man, which is specifically Adam and Eve, who, uh, you know, disobeyed the only commandment that God has given them at the Garden of Eden, which is not to eat of the forbidden tree there. And they chose to disobey God because they were deceived by Satan, and they ate of that tree. And because of that, each generation that was born after Adam and Eve, they were born with that sinful nature. And because of that, Romans 3.23, it says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And because of that sinful nature that mankind is born, they all come short of the glory of God. It's like when you're playing soccer, and you're playing soccer, and you shoot a ball into a, uh, to the goal area, and that ball lands in front in that penalty box, rather going afar or inside the goal. Now what, what happened to that ball? Did it go too short? Did it go too long? Or did it make it into the goal? It was too short. And likewise, you know, we're, we're ultimately in the need of being glorified in, in the image of God, in, in the idea that we are glorified in the place of eternity, in a place called heaven. But we come short of that because of one thing, which is our sinful nature. You don't teach a baby how to lie. You don't teach a baby how to be selfish. We are all born with a sinful nature. And we must make sure that we are, uh, we are saved Christians. We are born-again Christians that 
understand that we are born with a sinful nature, but because of our sins, although we are destined to enter a place called hell, which is eternal damnation, God sent his son out of his love, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for every one of our sin. And because he did that, he gives us the chance and the opportunity to repent and turn to him and accept Christ as our personal savior, that he's the only way. Not through religious works, not through any of that, but the fact that we have placed our faith in Jesus Christ alone, that he is the only way, the truth, and the life. And it says here, continuing, it's similar to what Peter was saying. Paul was mentioning that we must repent. And it was similar to what Peter was saying to a crowd in Acts chapter 3, when he witnessed a miracle, when, when, the, when the crowd witnessed a miracle here that was performed. Peter says to the crowds in Acts chapter 3, verse 19, Repent ye therefore and be converted, converted, that your sins may be blotted out, when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord and he shall send Jesus Christ which before was preached unto you. And Romans chapter 6 23 it says for the wages of sin is death but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And let us make sure that we recognize first within our life if we are truly a born again Christian. It's not that we are reading our Bible every day. It's not that we are going to church even a driving service every day but personally within our heart do we have faith that Jesus died on the cross for every one of our sins? And it is only through Jesus we can, be, we can see the uh, glory of God. We can see one day the eternal paradise of a place called heaven. That he's the one that covered our sin. He died on the cross for our sins. Have we placed our faith in that? And if we have not, I pray that we will make that decision. We will make our decision to trust and accept Jesus Christ as our personal Savior. And Paul was addressing the crowd here. He was addressing them, uh, to telling them that they need to repent because the day appointed is coming and so on. And he was uh, giving them an answer really throughout the all scripture that is mentioned. And likewise today, when we have the entire canon of the Bible, which is all 66 books of the Bible, now we have all of this, we are able to go and to, into all the cities, and all the communities, into all the neighborhoods and preach the gospel. But the question is, are we ready to give a defense for that? When people ask us, why do you believe that Jesus is the only way? Are we ready to give an answer for that? When people ask us, why do you believe God created the world? Are we ready to prepare and prepare to give an answer from the word of God? And let us make sure that we're taking some moments to uh, just study the scripture and quote scripture as best as possible because scripture is the greatest resource and source that we can footnote and cite when it comes to the defense of our personal faith in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. 2 Timothy 3.16, it says, All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction and instruction in righteousness. And, you know, we as Christians today, are we ready to continue to defend our faith with the greatest book of them all, which is the Word of God, uh, which is the Bible, which is inspired by God's breath himself to the various authors that he wrote, to the 40 different authors in all 66 books. Are we ready to give a defense for this? The Bible says in 2 Timothy 4, 2, preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. And let us make sure that we are taking some time, not only to meditate upon scripture, not only to take a verse and meditate upon that in our daily, day-to-day -day devotion, but also let's set a time in this quarantine pandemic time, let's set up maybe five minutes a day to uh, study some passages here and there, maybe study some various doctrines that accord to the Christian Orthodox faith, which includes such as the deity of Christ, which includes why Jesus is God, which includes salvation, which includes you know why we believe the Bible is the Word of God why we go to church and all these different doctrines let us take some moments during this week and set a time a schedule in our day to study that so that when somebody asks us a question about our faith our Christian faith why we gather at a drive-in theater or not a theater but a drive-in church at the community park there why we still want to worship God why still we still believe Jesus is the only way so that we can be ready let us make sure that we are studying scripture because scripture is a greatest source for the defense of our Christian faith.
And Paul was well-versed and well-knowledged in that, and he was ready to defend the faith here. And as we see Paul's defending of the faith through the classic example of apologetics, let us also see that there are different responses to that. There's different responses to that. And I want us to take a look at the second event here that occurred here in the Mars Hill, which is the dismissal of faith by a few people. And the dismissal of the faith from a few people. Acts chapter 17, verse 32. The Bible says here in verse 32, And when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked and others said, We will hear thee of this matter. And once again, in the previous uh, moment, we described how uh, Paul was explaining to them what Jesus did and who he is, and then also the resurrection of the dead. And he's explaining that, and the philosophers there that gathered, most of them were probably listening very intently. They never heard of this. They never heard of this God that created the heaven or earth. They never heard of this, you know, this idea that, you know, you know, uh, that Jesus is the one that did all this and all these amazing things that Paul was describing here in Acts chapter 17. They were they were not ready at all. And none of this sound like it's fake, none of this sound at all like it's 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 crazy. But as he was there as they're listening, and the moment that Paul says there's a resurrection of the dead, guess what some people say? Some mocked, others said, We will hear thee again of this matter. And notice here that these were those that were genuinely interested with everything that Paul had to say. But in the end, they could not accept the fact that there was a resurrection of the dead. And the people here were intently listening, but they had to scoff at the, scoff at the idea that such an occurrence would occur. That the resurrection of a dead person might have happened or might happen. They could not believe that at all. These people that believed in these mythological Greek lowercase gods could not believe that part at all. This was their stopping point. I can't believe that at all. And you know, I think about a time where I used to uh, sell door to door. Uh, back in 2012 and 2013, I used to work for a solar company known as Barango Solo. I hope uh, in our recording this is not a, a litigation issue where I named the company Barango Solo that I worked for back in 2012. But our job was very simple. It was canvassing around the neighborhood and you get $20 an hour. Okay, that's a good job for a college student, uh, especially with college students with some bills to pay. And, uh, you know, I love this job, and unfortunately, it was taking place in a city called Lancaster. If you know anything about Lancaster, it's in the middle of Antelope Valley. If you know anything about Antelope Valley, it's in the middle of a desert. So you can imagine how hot it gets. I know it's hot here, but it's much more hotter there. And, uh, you know, I was selling uh, solar, and this was brand new concept. This was not a, this was a new thing. You don't even recognize the name Varengo Solar because it was such a new company. It got, it was so popular and it got bankrupt within two, within two years. That's how fast it ran through. And uh, you know, our job was very simple. Go to door to door, you knock on the door, you tell them on solar, and your job at the door, really, in order for you to get a commission, which was an extra $25, in order, and that was extra money, of course, your job was to simply not sell them solar, but it was simply to do this, to set up a phone appointment with a sales agent at the solar company. So you were going to door to door and you're telling them, hey, you know, I'm not trying to sell you anything. You can legitimately say that and say, hey, I just want to let you know this is a new thing called solar. You might have heard president at the time was Barack Obama mentioning you get tax credits for this. I don't know if that was legal to say, but, uh, you know, you could you mention all those things. And then people did not know what solar was. And actually you explain to them and you explain to them like later, uh, you know, all you need to do right now with me is just set up a phone appointment with our sales guy. That's it, and you get $25 from that. And you know, you, I met all different kinds of people at the door, and you can imagine the neighborhoods being like Fieldmaster here, or Kiwi Court, or Almond Grove, and all these different neighborhoods. You've probably seen some of them now. Obviously, the response to these solar guys now is much more different back to, compared to 2012. In 2012, everybody, when you knock on a door and you tell them you're from Varengo Solar, they were interested. They were interested all the way. They were interested. They were wondering, what is this solar? Now, when they knock on the door and tell you that they're from so-and-so solar company, you tell them to get off your lawn. That's what you tell them. It's a different reaction nine years later or eight years later. But, you know, I remember going to door-to-door -door and uh, I would uh, uh, see a variety of different responses. But, you know, oftentimes, this is where it would happen. 
they would be so interested and I would feel like I would get, you, you probably, you probably wondering, you probably, uh, that I sold a lot of solar. I did not, because this is where I'm coming to the point. I go to the, I explain to them what solar is, and then I tell them, you know, so and so, and then they always ask me this final question, which is, how much would this usually cost? Now, I could play around and say, you know, I don't want, I, I don't really know the price, and I knew the price, but I, I, could, I could say I don't know the price. But if I did that, then they wouldn't set up the phone appointment, obviously. And I remember telling, I always told them the estimated price because number one, it's an honest thing to do. And uh, you know, number two, you know, it, would get, it would help get a phone appointment. And um, they would always hear the price, which is pretty hefty, like $20,000 to set up solar, okay? That's a lot of money if you didn't know this by now. But, um, and uh, they would always look at me and says, nope, not interested. And that would be almost every house. I would, every, every, every four to five hours, I would work every single day, uh, knocking on doors and selling them solar. And uh, I, would, I feel like they're into it, they're ready to uh, get that phone appointment. All I need is a phone appointment, that's all I need. And then I tell them the estimated cost, and they're like, nope, get out of my face. And um, you know, obviously what we're selling as Christians is not that much. It's actually not costly at all. It doesn't cost a dime. It's free. The greatest news. And uh, you know, to be honest with you, going to door to door as a Christian is much more easier than going to door to door as, as a, a, a Ferengo solar salesman because what we have is free. What we have is, you know, it's, it's completely free. We don't ask them for money. We don't ask them for anything. We, when we go to our friends, when we go to our uh, community events, when we go even canvassing door to door, socially distance, of course, with a mask, and we're telling them, you know, uh, I have this great thing. It's a free gift. Even on our website, we have something called a free gift. Why? Because it is a free thing. It is a gift. And it is the greatest thing that we can uphold. And that is the fact that Jesus died on the cross for our sins, and we can have eternal hope in heaven when we finally understand and acknowledge the gospel especially within that first moment of being justified by Jesus' blood and uh, you know as we go to that and we we have this free thing we have this wonderful amazing free gift and we're going and telling them to people and guess what even when it's free there's gonna be a lot of people that are gonna just reject it I don't want to hear it I, I don't want that at all you know, so winning and winning people to Christ is not like selling door to door. Solar panels are not needed. Listen to this. Solar panels are not needed by every individual in the city of Eastville. Look, if your electricity bill is not above $140, you don't qualify for solar. If you don't have a swimming pool in your backyard, you don't qualify for a lot of solar companies. Solar panels are not needed by every individual in the city of Eastville. But salvation is needed by every individual in the city of Eastvale. And that's where we need to understand that we need to continue to preach this more than ever before. Because what we have is something that every individual needs in order to enter a place called heaven in order to have, even within their hearts, hope, in order to have comfort, in order to have peace within their heart. We need to give them the filling of that void that, that's within their heart, which is the gospel of Jesus Christ that is needed by every individual. And let us make sure that we are continuously going out there. Every soul, regardless of who they are, needs Jesus. For it is written in Romans chapter 14, verse 11, 12, As I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, every tongue shall confess to the God, and every one of us will give an account of himself. And we must remember that no matter how many times we continue to preach the gospel, no matter how many times we continue to invite people to church, whether it's through canvassing, whether it's through personal invitation, no matter how many times, there will be simply many people that are hardened to avoid hearing that. There are going to be many people that are just not willing to listen to that. But the response that we as Christians, like the Apostle Paul had, as we notice here, is to continue to be in obedience to God and continue to preach the gospel. 
Matthew chapter 28, verse 19 to 20, it says, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded ye to do. And as we look at this passage here, let us make sure that we are continuously obeying the Word of God. Because ultimately, it is not about the results that matter more than anything. Yes, it is awesome to see people get saved. Yes, it's awesome to see people, uh, you know, more and people join our church and etc. But more than anything, the most important thing that is that we as Christians, that we are obedient to what God has commanded us to do, which is to preach the gospel. Our efforts will result in direct obedience to what God has commanded all Christians to do, and that is to preach the gospel. And that is what Paul was doing. And yes, there will be times where somebody will mock you. Yes, there will be times where somebody might make fun of you for believing in your Christian faith. Yes, there will be times where you're even your loved one might reject what we have to tell them this upcoming Thanksgiving or Christmas. And yes, that's going to happen. There will be rejections. But notice here, thirdly, Paul's faith, the decision by faith to persevere. The decision by faith to persevere. Acts chapter 17, verse 33, it says, So Paul departed from among them, howbeit certain men clave unto him, and believed among which was Dionys Dionysius of uh, the Areopagite, and a woman named Damaris, and others with them. And after these things, Paul departed from Athens and came to Corinth. In spite of the rejections, in spite of the mockery, we see here in the end, and although the Apostle Paul, we don't know his emotions, the author of the book of Acts did not notate his emotions as he was feeling, as he rejected, he was feeling rejected. And no doubt that doesn't matter because what happens, what matters the most is the decision that Paul made after. Not his emotional feelings, but what the decision he made, which is to continue to preach in the next city, which was at Corinth. But also within this passage, we see that there were two individuals that were very interested in what Paul was saying. They were super interested in what he was saying, and they chose to believe. One was a man that was probably well known amongst the people there. Another was a woman that maybe not might, might have not been well known, or perhaps was a wife of this man. We don't know exactly, uh, scripture doesn't say. But uh, you know, these two individuals and with others with them, they listened. And here's the thing, I think about a time within my life, especially as, you know, um, you know, we have our youth ministry, we have our youth events and all that. And uh, this is not a salvation uh, illustration, but there are times where, you know, I'll be the first to admit it, sometimes we plan an activity, a youth activity or a game or an activity during a camp, and uh, you, we have everything planned, but it just doesn't go according to plan. Okay, there's just sometimes that happens. Uh, some of you might uh, recognize this, when you plan a birthday party or maybe some gathering, etc., where you plan everything, but it just doesn't go according to plan. And, uh, you know, we had everything planned out with rides and transportations. All the teens said they're going to come, and uh, it was going to be an exciting event. But a minute or uh, 15 minutes before, everything goes into chaos because something here happens, something here happens, something within my personal life happens, and boom, boom, boom. It just, everything goes into chaos. Transportation, rise and work, the games and icebergs, they just, for the lack of better terms, excuse my language, but they just suck, okay? Uh, you know, they're just terrible. And, uh, you know, in the flesh, I'm saying, man, this event blows. You know, what's going on? What's going on? It didn't go according to plan. And then when I'm starting to drop off these teens one by one to their home, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, some of our chaperones drop them off. All four of these teams in the back seat, I remember this specific event. I remember as we're coming back and, you know, this event, it just, it, 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 went, it just went long. This was a long event and I was tired of, you know, I was tired and I was about to drop them off and I was wondering what did we really accomplish and I was just listening to the conversation the teens were having and guess what? They were being loud, 
and just talking about how this was a fun event. They got to make new friends in the youth group. They got to really just enjoy their time with the church family. They got to really enjoy the time to really, uh, they want to invite their friends in the next event that we have. They want to start to have more youth activities. They get so, you, the event might have not been perfect. They, our plans might have not worked, but it's not about us. That's what I figured out that night. That's what I understood that night, that it's not about us. Because God's in control of everything. God is aware of everything that's happening. God understands that some people are just going to be hardened to hear that. Some people are just going to reject it. God understands all that. And He wants us to acknowledge that we just need to be obedient to what God has commanded us to do. And likewise, Paul was obedient to Him and he just continued to preach. And guess what? Although there is not, it may not have been the result that he might have wanted to attain, but guess what? Ultimately, God was glorified because these two individuals were saved and others might have been saved as well and others were still claiming and willing to listen and Paul continued on to the next city of Corinth where he made a huge difference in that city and he was remaining faithful. And ultimately, we as Christians must acknowledge this, that everything that we do, as we continue to preach the gospel, Everything that we do is ultimately for the glory of God. It's not about self. It's not about self-reputation. It's not about everything that we did. It's about what God has planned for each and every one of us through and using us as His vessels to carry out His will. And we must continue to remain faithful. And yes, there will be moments where somebody would just doesn't want to hear the gospel. And yes, as you're going door to door and you're knocking on those doors and people are saying, oh, I don't want to hear this, I don't want to hear this, and the next door, door, and you might get rejected, but let, let us be encouraged by Scripture to continue on preaching, just as the Apostle Paul has. The Apostle Paul didn't give up. In fact, we see this over and over within his life. You know, as he was in jail in the Roman prison there, he was writing to the Philippi church, which he planted in his, in his uh, missionary journeys, and he was, he was uh, writing to them. He was, he was writing this, and he wrote this, and he wrote an encouraging note here in Philippians chapter 3, verse 13 to 14, a uh, text that I preached this morning to our teens this morning. He says, Brethren, I can't not myself to be apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Paul was stoned at Lystra in his second missionary journey. Yet, he was being kicked out of the city, they dragged him out, they stoned him outside the city, and later he comes back to the same city. And over and over and over again, we see this pattern within Paul's life, where in some cities he gets rejected. In some areas he gets stoned. I'm not saying we're gonna get stoned. If you get stoned, you could call 911, and tell them somebody committed assault to you. We have that luxury in the United States. Paul didn't have that. But Paul, over and over, as he wrote, pressing towards the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus, continued to stay tenacious in his faith. And he continued to preach. Yes, Athens didn't go according to maybe his plans. We don't know that. He might have been joyful. You never know that. The scripture doesn't record that. But we see this over. What, what is recorded is this. Despite mockery, despite rejection, despite all of this, Paul kept pressing forward. He kept going forward by faith. And let us be encouraged by that. Let us be encouraged as we try to invite a neighbor. Let us be encouraged by... Uh, when we try to invite a friend. Let us be encouraged as we continue to try to preach the gospel to remain faithful and to acknowledge that some will reject, some will deny. But let us continue to remain faithful. And so this evening, let us continue to apply what we learned to the character here of the Apostle Paul. And he was ready to defend the faith through Scripture and let us commit to studying the Scripture on a day-to-day -day basis to help in the readiness of our faith, and let us also commit to preach the gospel despite rejections and even the great victories. Let us continue to press forward because it's about being obedient to what God has commanded us to do. 
And ultimately, it is about God's glory, and we must follow the Great Commission and command to continue to preach the gospel. And let us never give up, for there may be a Dionysus and Damaris, and even a few more, and even Corinth, waiting abroad for your faithfulness to preach the gospel. And let us, as a church family, move forward by faith in reaching our city, in reaching our community, in reaching the next generation, so that ultimately God will be glorified and God will be pleased with our being. And uh, whatever decision that you need to make, make that decision. And uh, I'll pray for uh, tonight for all of us because we all need this. We all need this encouragement. None of us are an expert, but we all must press toward the mark. We all must move forward by faith. Let's pray. Dear God, I just want to ask you, Lord, to just be with each and every one of us. Help us to remain faithful unto you. And God, I pray that you would just watch over us and, uh, you know, help us to study the Word of God. Help us to defend our faith with Scripture. Help us to move forward and persevere, even despite rejection, even despite oppression. I pray that you would help us to move forward by faith. Help us never to give up in our labor to uh, be obedient to what you have commanded us to do. We thank you once again for this day. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thanks again for joining us for our youth live stream night. If you need anything, please fill out the connection form. Have a good week. See you next Sunday.